morning, friends. I am Michael Matt, and this is a special edition of The Remnant Underground. This morning, New Year's Eve morning at 934 Rome time, year of our Lord, 2022, His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI went to his eternal reward. The 95-year-old pontiff received the last rites of the church and then, while reports went quietly to God. And I think it's really important uh, at this moment to, to, to discuss the passing of Benedict as adult Christian believers rather than emotional children who would use the drama of death itself to serve some, some personal agenda. Um, let's not, for example, turn this into a, a yet another celebrity death event in which we close a blind eye to reality or, on the other hand, lionize and canonize and, and, and just make the whole thing. Uh, sort of ridiculous. I don't think this is a, a, the right time for that. I, I, I would encourage, obviously, first of all, that we all pray for the repose of the soul of Pope Benedict XVI, and then we reflect on his passing with an honest appraisal of his pontificate and his long service uh, to Holy Mother Church, where, wherever you come down on the politics of of Benedict XVI. The fact that this man served <laughs> Mother Church loyally and f- throughout his entire life certainly makes him one of the great churchmen of the second half of the 20th century and certainly should win him the admiration of all of us that he tried his best in the moment of incredible, or a time of incredible turmoil and upheaval in the church to serve the church, I think, as best he could. And I have many disagreements with with Benedict, which are a matter of the public record. Now, the Holy Father's funeral is going to be offered in uh, outside of St. Peter's Basilica by Pope Francis on January 5th. And it's going to be interesting because everyone's going to be watching to see now how is the Vatican going, Vatican going to spin the pontificate of Pope Benedict XVI. My prediction <laughs> is that they will canonize Benedict within a couple of years, more or less as a reward for, this, for his silence in the face of the most destructive pontificate in the history of the papacy. Why was he silent? None of, we don't know. Was he silent out of dedication and devotion to the church? He wanted to avoid schism. He wanted to avoid controversy. He was a silent sufferer. All of these things we can speculate about. I don't know. You don't know. And so I think we're just going to have to let a little time pass, a little reflection uh, uh, as the years, months and years pass to try to figure out what this was all about. Because obviously this was one of the most... Uh, controversial uh, reigns or pontificates uh, in a sense, in a good sense and in a bad sense, at the second half of the pontificate that we've seen in a very, very long time in church history. However, I think it's also fair to, to, to say that if they do fast track Benedict's canonization without due process, as they are wont to do these days, then let the historical record show that the Pope who saved the traditional Latin Mass has been raised to the altars. Let's keep that front and center, no matter what they say at the Vatican. No matter how they may try to change and alter and rewrite the history of what happened, that's the thing that matters the most. Because this was Pope Benedict's most historic accomplishment. What he did liturgically for the Church will be the thing in the very first entry in the encyclopedias and in the history books of this, of this period and with respect to Benedict. So the reason for, for reasons for Benedict's abdication remain enshrouded in mystery. I'm not going to pretend like they don't, or am I going to pretend like I have some inside dope on this? We don't. We may never know what really happened. And speculation will no doubt, again, be printed on the pages of history books for years and years to come. But I'm going to make no attempt to get into that right now. I think it would be sort of untoward. The man just passed away. We're in the process of praying for him, burying him, and so forth. To get it all, in, all into the intrigue and the politics, I think, would be, would be ill-placed. So I would prefer to limit this brief reflection on the passing of Benedict to the things that we know for sure, especially those of us who lived through his reign. I, I was in the Piazza San Pietro when, he was, when Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was announced as the next pope. I was there covering that conclave. Uh, it was a moment of jubilation that I will never, ever forget because, again, we knew that although Ratzinger had been the ramrod for John Paul and he certainly he was at the council and there were, there were controversy, you still had the sense that Ratzinger was of the old school, that he had the faith, that he had retained the faith despite many, many disagreements, which we published in our, 
in our newspaper over the years with, with Cardinal Ratzinger. We, make no, we made no, no secret of that. Still, there was the sense that the man had the faith still and that he would do good things for the, for the church. Michael Davies, for example, knew him personally and was absolutely convinced that Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger would, in the end, do great things for the traditional Latin mass movement. Michael Davies did not live to see Ratzinger become pope, but he certainly was right that this man did great things for the traditional Latin mass movement. So that jet jubilation that I felt in my heart, I was dancing in the streets when, when they announced that he was, in, he was to be the next pope, that he had been selected. In many ways, that jubilation turned out to be justified because history is surely going to record that Pope Benedict XVI reawakened an entire generation of Catholics to the importance of the traditional liturgical patrimony of the Catholic Church. If it is the Mass that matters, and I believe it is, if the Mass that matters most, then the pontificate of Pope Benedict XVI mattered more than any pope since the Council. What Benedict did to save the Mass can never be undone either. So all of my children, for example, attend the Latin Mass every Sunday in a diocesan church to this day, thanks to Benedict. Each of my children was baptized and confirmed in the traditional rite, thanks to Benedict. And this is the case for millions of young people today around the world. You know, for, 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 for entire generations of Catholic parents were exceedingly grateful to Pope Benedict. And you need to say all these things, put this all in context, so that we can also be honest about the second part of what happened under the reign of, of Pope Benedict, which of course was most unfortunate. But thanks to Benedict's intervention, and this is going to be the same, there's nothing, nothing anyone can change this. Thanks to his intervention on, the, on behalf of the Latin Mass, many thousands of young priests today are saying the Latin Mass, they've learned the Latin Mass, the Mass which might otherwise have been confined to the dustbin of history. The Fraternity of St. Peter exists today because of Pope I should say Ratzinger, but Pope Benedict's direct intervention as Cardinal Ratzinger on behalf of the fraternity, on behalf of the Mass. And let's not forget, it was Pope Benedict who lifted the excommunications of the bishops of the Society of St. Pius X as well. So generally speaking, in other words, the legacy of Pope Benedict XVI is one of revival, revival of sanity, of faith, of vocations, in what otherwise was a, <laughs> could be described as a, as, as a post-conciliar dark time, if not a, an actual nightmare. It was the one bright spot of the post-conciliar era, epoch. And using the full weight of his office, Pope Benedict made it clear that the traditional Latin mass had never been abrogated. In the past, it had never been abrogated and it could never be canceled in the future, thus ending 40 years of modernist fake news and, yeah, treachery where the war against tradition and against the Mass was concerned. We owe him a great debt of gratitude for that. I grew up with this fight over this dis heated debate. Paul VI had abrogated the old Mass. It was gone forever. Back and forth, back and forth for 20, 30 years. And when Benedict came along, he said it had never been abrogated. Second Vatican Council had not canceled the traditional Mass. Pope Paul VI had not abrogated the traditional Mass. This was a huge, huge moment in the history of this Catholic counter-revolution. So it's thanks to Benedict that each and every one of us can, with good conscience today, resist the agenda of Pope Francis, I would call it an evil agenda, attempting to cancel the Latin Mass. And that <laughs> is exactly what we here at the Remnant TV intend to continue to do, to resist this evil agenda to cancel the Mass that Benedict restored to the Church, always standing on the authority now of the Pope, the Pope who restored the Latin Mass, Benedict, and who confirmed our inalienable right to have access to that Mass. So we're going to wait and see what the Vatican's going to do. We're going to wait and see what Francis is going to do. But I would say to Francis, if I had his ear, by all means, Holiness, canonize Benedict just as soon as you possibly can. Canonize the Pope who saved the Latin Mass. Raise to the altars the Holy Father who stood with tradition and with traditionalists and who famously said what earlier generation held as sacred remains sacred and great for us to today in reference to the Latin Mass. You cannot take the Latin Mass down. You cannot cancel it. It is great and it is holy for us today, said Benedict. Now that's evidently not so for the current occupant of Peter's chair, of course, 
But that's his problem, not ours. We got our marching orders from Pope Benedict XVI, and we intend to march for as long as it takes. Now we're going to have more on, on the passing of Pope Benedict in the pages of the remnant in the days to come, of course, days and weeks to come. But let me just conclude with this. The passing of Pope Benedict XVI represents the end of an era. Especially in his early years, there's no doubt Joseph Ratzinger was certainly an old school modernist, a progressivist. He served as a paratus at Vatican II, and he went to his grave defending the council. So we make no attempt here to rewrite history. We're just trying to be fair. We're trying to be balanced. We're trying to be honest in evaluating this pontificate and the passing of this pope. And I would say the difference between Benedict and Francis is that one genuinely loved the church, while the other seems intent on dismantling it, quite frankly. One kept the faith that his mother you know, and his father had lovingly taught him 95 years ago in Bavaria, while the other may never have truly had the faith in the first place. It's just the reality. During his reign, we, we never imagined under Ratzinger, under Benedict, we never imagined that he was, <laughs> he was the Rottweiler traditionalist that the New York Times said he was. We knew what he was. But we stood with him because he defended us, because he defended our cause, because he defended the mass of our fathers, the faith of our fathers in many, many ways. So in the end, even if we disagreed with him on important matters, Pope Benedict XVI was a just father, a good shepherd to his sheep, to his children. And yeah, we're forever grateful to him for what he did, disagreements notwithstanding. Did, did, did it break our hearts when, for whatever reason, Benedict handed the church over to Bergoglio in 2013 and then remained terribly quiet, terribly silent about this disastrous pontificate for the rest of his days? Of course it did. Of course it did. This is the diabolical disorientation that we all face. It's the reality we all face. It's a church in crisis and chaos that we all face. I don't know why it happened. Why did he do this? Why did he abrogate? I don't know. <laughs> Fear of the wolves? Well, that's how he started out, didn't he? Pray that I don't flee for fear of the wolves. Of course, it looked like he fled. Well, what were the pressures? I don't know. I don't pretend to know. But we do know that the devil has taken up residency inside the Vatican over the past 50 years, and it's anybody's guess what's going on over there, right? I don't know. It is what it is. And I won't speculate just to support some dramatic theory and how I wish things had ended up for this pontificate or how I wish things to be. I don't know. I just don't know. But I do know one thing, friends. The Pope is dead. We need to pray for him, pray for the repose of his soul. And I thank God for what he did, what he did for me, what he did for my children, what he did for our church under siege before he abdicated. And nobody can ever change that. It's what he did. That's part of the historical record. That's the greatness of his pontificate. But I'm just gonna go ahead and leave judgment of the abdication of Pope Benedict, leave that judgment to God and to history. Maybe someday we'll understand, because right now we don't. We don't understand. One of the great crises of the past 10 years, 15 years in the church, that, he ab that Benedict abdicated. And we pray for his soul anyway. And again, we're grateful for everything that he did. So eternal rest grant unto Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict, O Lord, and that perpetual light shine upon him May his soul and all the souls of the faithfully departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. <laughs>